Today we will witness how mathematics can make amazing predictions even when the underlying model of reality is far from perfect. But let's begin with a simple question. What happens if you throw a rock up in the air? Well, it will fall back down. But what if you throw it harder? It will of course get higher, but eventually it still is going to fall down. Let's see what actually takes place when you are throwing a rock. You apply some effort, and as a result, the rock acquires some initial velocity v sub zero. And that gets the rock some kinetic energy, or in other words, the energy that the rock possesses due to its motion, which, as we perfectly know, equals this, where m is the mass of the rock. The rock will stop because kinetic energy will gradually diminish all the way to zero, and so will the velocity as the result of the gravitational force. But what is the gravitational force that holds the rock down? According to Newton's law of universal gravitation, the force between two objects is equal to this, where m1 and m2 are the respective masses of the objects, and r is the distance between their centers of masses. g is a so-called gravitational constant, the actual value of which doesn't matter to us at the moment. In our case, the formula will look like so where capital M is the mass of our planet, small m is the mass of the rock, and because we can neglect the size of the rock compared to Earth, r is just the radius of our planet. Now, the fact that the rock has certain energy means that it can perform certain amount of work in terms of lifting up. If our rock is moving to height h against some constant force f, then the absolute amount of work that the rock performs equals f multiplied by h. And if at height h the rock grinds to a halt, that means that its kinetic energy fully translated into work of lifting the rock to height h. In our case, this formula works well for small values of h, because the difference between the gravitational force at the beginning and at the end of trajectory is negligible. The force is almost constant along h, and energy according to the formula almost equals the actual energy. But what if we threw our projectile with a much greater force and it will naturally fly much higher? Height h in this case is considerable and the gravitational force f will already be significantly different between these two points and our formula will end up being quite inaccurate. But let's try something else then. Let's split the trajectory of the rock into two equal parts and we will denote each one as delta x. Now we can approximate the result a bit better by first calculating the amount of work required to move the rock through the first part, and that will be f1 delta x, and then the second part, which is f2 delta x. The total work then equals the sum. It is a better approximation, but still not great. It would be even better if, instead of splitting the initial trajectory into two equal parts, we split it into three and would get the following for total work. Overall, if we pick some higher number n and split h into n equal parts, then this would be an even better approximation. But this expression is what is called a Riemann sum of function f on the interval from r to r plus h. And when n tends to infinity, the sum tends to the integral of f over the distance h. But we know how to take integrals, at least for simple functions. As follows from the fundamental theorem of calculus, our integral equals the difference of antiderivative of f at point r plus h minus antiderivative at point r. So we need to find antiderivative to the gravity force function. Let's put away the multiplier for a second and focus on the remaining part. The antiderivative is minus 1 over x. It's very easy to check this. Let's see what derivative of minus 1 over x will be. Remembering that derivative of any power function is this for any real value of b. In our case, p equals minus 1 and we get 1 over x squared. Bringing back the multiplier concludes the task of finding antiderivative to gravitational force. We can now calculate the integral, but that, as we remember, must equal our kinetic energy, which is right here. Well, small m now obviously cancels out and we can determine the velocity that is required in order to elevate the rock to height h. Now this is great because it allows us to answer an even more interesting question. What velocity is needed to throw the rock so hard that it never returns? 
Well, that means that h tends to infinity and clearly this value tends to zero and our velocity will be as follows. This value is called the escape velocity, which is literally the minimum velocity sufficient to escape the gravitational pull of the planet. In fact, this is exactly the velocity that any rocket has to acquire as a minimum if we wanted to escape the gravity of Earth to travel to Moon or Mars, for instance. In 18th century, geologist John Mitchell and independently a famous mathematician Pierre-Simon Laplace used this formula to arrive at a very interesting conclusion. To understand what they did, let's see what happens if in our equation for escape velocity we increase the mass of m of our celestial body, with all the rest being equal. With a higher value of m, the required escape velocity will also become higher. Similarly, if we decrease the radius r, all else being equal, the escape velocity once again increases. So the conclusion is that escape velocity is high for compact, heavy celestial objects. And technically, as long as we can keep compressing the matter further and further, we can make the value of V0 as high as we want. Which means that at a certain point it will be higher than the speed of light. And if we assume that the light particles are subject to gravity, then this means that light cannot escape the surface of such objects. Sounds familiar? It should. This is the earliest known prediction of black holes. Only Mitchell called them differently at the time, dark stars. It is remarkable that they predicted this purely mathematically. First evidence pointing at black holes appeared only in the second half of the 20th century, and the really compelling argument and data in support of the black hole hypothesis was only acquired in the 21st century as gravitational waves got confirmed by the LIGO observatory. But these guys predicted black holes in the 18th century, and they actually went even further. Mitchell even suggested how to find a dark star and how to estimate how many dark stars are there in our celestial neighborhood. An absolutely brilliant idea. His idea was to look into binary star systems. He suggested that in the case when a star seems to orbit a massive but unseen companion, it is in fact a binary star system where one of them is a dark star. And ultimately supporting evidence of this has been acquired in the 20th century, where binary systems like Cygnus X1 was discovered that consists of a blue supergiant and a black hole that was approximately 15 masses of the sun and the event horizon of only 300 kilometers, which is less than a distance from Houston to Dallas. But the most amazing part of it all is that this prediction was based on a technically wrong model of reality. Nowadays we know that black holes are black holes for a different reason. It's not that a strong gravitational field would prevent photons from moving. In fact, gravity cannot change the speed of light at all. It can only change the direction and frequency of light, but not the speed. Black holes are black holes because the strong gravitational field of a black hole drastically warps space-time, fundamentally changing its geometry and rewiring the paths that the light can travel. The light cannot escape a black hole not because of the strong gravitational pull per se, but because there is simply no concept of escaping a black hole. There is simply no path that leads outside the event horizon. So dark stars were a wrong model, yes, but with huge implications for science. Which makes this a great story of amazing curiosity and the power of human mind. Thank you for watching. If you find this video helpful, please hit the like button, share it with friends and subscribe to my channel.